All right, all of you out there in Facebook land, we are getting started here on this Wednesday night, and it's great to have you aboard. David's going to be teaching us again tonight. Had a great uh, word last week, and uh, he's going to be teaching for all the month of September. While you're on here, just remind you that uh, we're going to have men's meeting this Friday night, and right over here to my right will be our special speaker. Okay. Anointed, blessed, you, know, you cannot change your mind. That is beyond the purview, brother. So, uh, hadn't, hadn't planned a ladies' meeting quite yet. Uh, of course, they're still meeting Tuesday morning, you know, all that. But uh, as far as the monthly meeting, soon and very soon. Uh, don't have anything on the calendar as of yet. All right, let's pray and get started. Father, we just thank you for the word you put in David's heart. I thank you, Father, that it will speak to our hearts and our minds. <clears throat> and I thank you, Lord God, that as you speak to him, that you then give us revelation as you have given to him. Father, I thank you that revelation didn't just come to one man and then all of a sudden we hear it and go, wow. Then revelation comes to us as how to take this truth and apply it to our very lives. We just thank you, Father. <clears throat> thank you for David. Thank you for all you do through his ministry. And thank you, Lord God, for what you have given him for us tonight. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All of you that are on there, remember tonight, if you hear certain things that you like, go ahead and type it in. Type in share if you'd like to share this with other people, as well as putting in your comments as we go on through it tonight. So David's coming now. Did uh, anybody bring their little handouts? If you didn't, if you didn't, um, it said we'll be in Second Corinthians four, pretty much, probably, and Second Corinthians one, possibly, uh, more than likely, Second Corinthians four, and then of course we'll roll into Second Corinthians five as well. Um, Mike uh, Merrill is speaking Friday at the men's meeting, which I attend on a regular basis. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I haven't known Mike that well. But I was coming to church Sunday, and um, and I and I had to I came in and I had to leave uh, to go check my phone while, while the music was going on. And so when I came back in, Mike was acting like he was the usher. He goes, "Sir, is this?" Uh, is this your uh, first time here? And I, you know, I was like, <laughs> I was like, no. And I go, um, I said, I've already got one of those, Mike, because I thought he was serious. And he goes, well, is this your first time here? And I went, he goes, well, if it's your first time, we got a lot of questions we want to ask you. Wonder he didn't put one of those red things on. And so I got tickled and. <laughs> So I told Mike, I said, if you're going to tell jokes Friday, I, I might come. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. So last Monday we introduced this subject, and uh, like I say, I've taught it many times here, uh, and it's it's my foundation. It's uh, it's it's where I live. It's where I live this week. It's where I live today. Um, but what we if, what we tried to do just in in in, in brief review is we started in 2 Corinthians 5 and we read this scripture in 2 Corinthians 5 verses 1 through 5 or uh, 1 through 6 <clears throat> and we read it as a standalone and it it basically you know lends itself to hey one day that you're going to put off your body and you're going to get a heavenly body and we're groaning for uh, for heaven now basically which is no surprise to anyone right uh, that that's what we want to do. The, but my purpose was to uh, establish that that we're groaning in this body not for that we would be unclothed, not that we would have to put off this body to receive the, the same yearnings that we have in this body uh, that we're going to expect when our body's redeemed. And what I told you I wanted to do was Obviously, read 2 Corinthians 5 and, and, and establish that, but then go back into 2 Corinthians 4, and let's just roll down into it, because we know Paul didn't say, stop the presses, chapter 5, new thought, right? And so we wanted to go back into 2 Corinthians 4 and see exactly how he set this up. So uh, we went back into um, 
uh, Romans 8 about giving life to our mortal flesh, right? Our mortal body. And we established um, that this being swallowed up of life in, cha in 2 Corinthians 5 is not just the redemption of our body, but the very life of Jesus made manifest in our mortal body. Do y'all remember all that? Sure. Okay. All right, so let's go to the very beginning. We, we started in uh, 2 Corinthians 4 uh, in verse uh, 6, I believe. And we picked up there. <clears throat> and I started there, and I'm just going to pick up there again, okay? So what, I'm gonna, what, I, what, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to establish the context of 2 Corinthians 5. And when we do, I think you're going to see something very, very powerful and, and again, as been my custom lately, I, I go ahead and, and, and shoot the, uh, the, uh, the punchline, if you will, and then let's, let's discover how we got there. But basically it's this, guys. We're yearning. We're, the scripture says we're yearning to be clothed with our dwelling, which is from heaven, 2 Corinthians 5. If the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In this we groan. Deeply desiring to be clothed with our dwelling, which is from heaven. Okay, David, no, no, that's no news flash. We all want to go to heaven. But then he goes on to say, we groan in this tent, not for that we would be unclothed, not that we would die, but that this mortal would be swallowed up of that life. And the, the thing that is significant to me is the context. He's saying, guys, the, the yearning that you have in this body is the same yearning for the things that you think are only available at the redemption of your body. Now, somebody might say, David, what are you saying? That, that we can have just what we have in heaven here in this body? I don't know. You know, Paul said, I'm in a twitch between uh, two to go on and be with the Lord or to stay here and to go on and be with the Lord is better. But I think what I want to emphasize is have we, have we possibly exper experienced what it means to have the life of Jesus made manifest in our mortal flesh? And I know we've had taste of it. You know, we all have. But I think Jesus gave us a lifestyle in the Gospels of what it means to have that, that life made, made manifest in our mortal flesh. So obviously that's what we want to see. And then, of course, we went to Philippians about attaining unto the resurrection. Paul says, I haven't already attained. Well, we know that, Paul. You haven't attained unto the resurrection because you haven't died. But obviously Paul was talking about attaining unto the resurrection while still in this mortal flesh. And so the, the, the bottom line is this. God has provided a way for us. The yearnings, the deep yearnings to be clothed with our dwelling, which is from heaven, that higher realm of life, that unseen realm, and groaning in this body, I believe with all my heart, if you can groan for it in this body, then the fulfillment of it is in this body. What we're going to experience at the redemption of our body will be yet seen. But if I'm yearning in this mortal flesh, it would be cruel for God to say, because we're going to see in 2 Corinthians 4, He's going to show you that he's going to show you how to look on the unseen, look on it, yearn for it, groan for it, but you can't have it till you die. That's just not even that's just not even fair, you know. And so we're going to see that 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 took place. OK, I don't know how far we're going to get. I'm going to take my time with this. And obviously you see where I'm going. Uh, and I and, 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 and before I finish the punchline, the groans. What, what is the voice of the groans? groans groan, we're groaning within ourselves for our, the redemption of our body. Not for that we'd be unclothed, but clothed upon that this mortal would be swallowed up of life. That this mortal would be swallowed up of that life. What, is, what gives voice to the groans? Praying in the Spirit. And we're going to see that as we, <laughs> as we tie this into Romans 8. The Spirit himself... The Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings too deep for words. For we know not what to praise we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes those groanings too deep for words. So here's the beautiful thing, guys. The unseen realm that's so far above what you could ask or think, He's given us the voice of the Spirit to access the mind of the Spirit and the will of God to access that those groans to be for everything that's in our lives that's mortal to be swallowed up of life. 
I tell you, I, I, I pray this all the time. I say, Lord, you know, I look at my life, I look at things going on in my life, and I go, Lord, this feels so mortal. <laughs> this feels grievous. This hurts. This feels so downtrodden. This feels so, so I'm, I want to access the voice of heaven. I want to access the voice of the Spirit to give voice to those groans. That's what God's given us. And I mentioned last week the first fruits of the Spirit. We've all put the first fruits of the Spirit as just a little bit of the Spirit. Yet nowhere in the Scriptures does it say we just have a little bit of the Spirit. You know, we've been given the very Spirit of Christ. And it's that first fruit of the Spirit that's yearning in us for us to gain full possession of it. I think we're going to look at that next week. Uh, that it's not just about, well, you got a little bit, then when you die, you get it all. The, the first fruit of the Spirit is inside of us to give us a spirit of revelation so that we can possess the entire inheritance. Amen? Amen. All right. Verse 6, 2 Corinthians 4. For it is God who commands light to shine out of darkness. It, this may not be exactly the way yours says it, okay? For God who commands a light to shine out of darkness has shined in our heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the context of what, 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 what is darkness, when light is shining out of darkness, we're going to see what the context is. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And last week we were establishing the context. We have what, what is the treasure that we have in earthen vessels? That the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. In other words, the revelation of Christ. All that Jesus has accomplished for us and the light, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, which is the face of Jesus Christ. And that's going to shine in your what? In your spirit? Yes, it's obviously in your spirit, but it's going to shine where? In your heart, where you live. That is so important. I can't tell you how many times I've said, Lord, how many, how many, how many your, your soul, you know, your soul, why are you so downtrodden, oh my soul? You know, why? You know, um, I've told you all my stories about waking up in the morning and having to fight off oppression and, and, uh, God gave me a uh, promise in Psalms, you know, very, very familiar uh, scripture. Um, Thou hast turned my mourning into dancing and put off my sackcloth or my clothes of sorrow and clothed me with gladness to the end that my soul would sing praises to you and not be silent. God wants to affect our soul. He wants to affect where we live, your soul, your cardia. Your mind, your intellect, your feelings, your emotions. You know, if we don't have that effect, that's where we win and lose, is it not? When you don't feel like praying and you have a really, and you know, and we have to go through our little mental exercises, you know, of, well, this is not real. This is, you know, this is, this is, you know, this is, uh, I don't mean to say little exercises. They're very, they're very vital. But it's sometimes it's so hard to pull yourself up by the bootstrap sometimes, you know. And so I said, Lord, you know, you want to affect my soul. I, I, I don't want to have to always be pulling myself up by my bootstraps trying to get, trying to get past these feelings, these, these feelings of depression and feelings of oppression. So he's shining the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in our hearts. And that's, folks, this is a place of, of faith, a, a place of possession. When you are in darkness, and if that darkness is being manifested by depression, oppression, fear, lack, whatever the darkness is, how it's manifesting itself, you've got a God who commands light to shine out of that darkness. The light, I've got the light of the knowledge of the glory of God available to me, and I'm going to release my faith in that. You know, I'm going to recruit that. I'm going to stop and say, Lord, I don't feel so great. I feel terrible right now, as a matter of fact. I feel awful. And I don't feel like praying. I don't, there's no faith. I'm not feeling any faith. And so I go here and I say, but I know that you want to send the light of the knowledge of the glory of God as it pertains to the very darkness that's trying to beset me right now. I can recruit. I can lay hold of. I can possess the light of the knowledge of the glory of God 
the revelation of Jesus from my need at that moment, right? That's kind of coming boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy, to receive mercy and find grace to help in my time of need, right? Yes. You know, I love that in my time of need, not in somebody else's time. You know, not people who say, well, you know, God's timing is not your timing. You know, yes, it is. When I'm hurting, he wants to meet me at the point because he's a very present help. Amen. The time of trouble. Amen. Right? Amen. So, it is God who commands light to shine out of darkness and has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. When I was preparing this message or just meditating on it uh, uh, again today, I didn't get past this verse. Uh, yeah, that's great. I just didn't get past it. I was praying it and, and the Lord just said, David, everything that I've accomplished for you in the revelation of Jesus, I want to put in your heart in the context of what's besetting you right now, what you're feeling right now. I want to give you all that the, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And it's a treasure, David. It's a treasure. Yeah. You know, if you found a treasure, would it change your day? If you found a treasure in your backyard and you opened it up and went, oh my God. You know, would it change your demeanor? <laughs> would it change your paradigm for that particular moment? Or maybe even for your whole life? And we have a treasure. And so, and he said, David, go get this treasure. Go get it. Don't let your feelings, don't be intimidated by your feelings. I get intimidated by my feelings sometimes. Like, I feel bad, therefore it's bad, <laughs> you know? And it allows you to take you down that take you down that course of having a bad day, bad week, bad month, whatever the case may be. All right, the not, light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. We have this treasure in earth and vessel that the excellent or the excellency of the power may be of God and not of ourselves. I meditated on that for just so long today. Isn't it a beautiful thing that the darkness that comes against us? The dark, and I don't mean to go this slow, but I'm just, I'm just hanging out on some of these things. But the, <clears throat> the darkness that besets us in the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, we have this treasure in earth and vessel. And what, it, what is that going to emit? What is it going to produce? Power. Against what? The darkness. And it's a treasure. And it's not of myself. How many of you have... I, sometimes the bigger problem is my effort to get out of a problem, my effort to find a solution, my effort to find a remedy. That causes me more pain than the situation itself. But to come to a place where the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is shining in my heart in such a level that it produces a treasure and it emits power not of myself. That takes me out of the equation, does it not? And I'm like, Lord, I don't know how you're going to fix this. You know, I don't know how you're going to fix this. This morning, I, I got hit with something. And I was already hit. Y'all know the feeling. Yep. You're already hit. You're already down. You're already going, man. You're already, that word groanings, we groan within ourselves. You know what it means? To sigh. <sighs> That's what that means. So I was already sighing, if you will, over the repetitive nature of, of a particular situation. And then I get a phone call out of the blue that stuck another dagger in me. And, and, and it was almost, you, could, you, ever, you ever just almost like stand aside and look and go, <laughs> so this is the way it's going to be. So now that is so, it's a demonstration of power. <laughs> well, I mean, it was like, okay, I said, so this is the way it's going to be. And in the past, there would have been anger that would have rose up in me. And I would have defended myself and, and argued with this particular situation. But there was a, a, for lack of a better word, which we're going to see here in just a second, there was a death that took place. Just, I just went, because the power is not of myself. It's power is not of myself. I don't need to defend myself. I know who I am. I know I've done the best I can. I know I have. And 
and I just sighed and my voice went to God, you the God who commands light to shine out of this darkness, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And there's a revelation of Jesus. Jesus, you were touched with this feeling. You destroyed it. You're with me. You know how I feel. You've destroyed the part of me that's taking the brunt of this, which we'll get to in a second. And there's a light of the knowledge of the glory of God, and there's going to be power to be emitted. And I do not have to defend myself. You're going to justify me. And that was a, a beautiful place of letting uh, the power not of myself start to come forth. And has the situation resolved itself? It has not yet. But I'm not going to take the sting of it, you know, that I would have normally. Once you exercise that faith in your heart, how do you feel? I mean, there's there's a there's a comfort, you know, there's a, there's a there's a comfort, there's a there's a. Once you exercise that faith, you feel a release in your heart. Yeah, you know, from a standpoint of the angst, the angst of trying to fix it. I'm like, you know, I, I can't fix it. You can't change the way people view you, you know. Um, you just have to, you know, you know, God, you justify, you know. Anyway, um, we have this treasure in earthen earth vessels that the excellent the power may be of God and not of, not of us. All right, so here, now he's going to get in verse 8. He's going to give you the context of what the darkness is. He's going to give you the context of why you need the power. He's going to give you the context of, of, of why you have this treasure in earth and vessel. Because he says, we have this treasure in earth and vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of, not of us. Verse 8, we are hard pressed on every side. King James says troubled on every side. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. And we went over this last week. They're basically, they're basically paradoxes of each other. We're hard pressed, but you're not hard pressed. You're perplexed, but you're really not perplexed. When you, the word perplexity means you just don't know what to do. Right. And have, that's probably a con, concept that we can, probably can relate to probably more than anything. Mm -hmm. Just don't know what to do. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair persecuted but not forsaken, struck down. Struck down means like an athlete struck down to the ground. That's where, that's, that was the metaphor that they were used, like an athlete back then, like a wrestler would be thrown down to the ground. You're thrown down to the ground, but you're not cast down. You're, you're cast down, but you're not cast out. You're not, you're not, you're not defeated. All right, so I'm hard-pressed on every side, but I'm not distressed. Why because the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is shining in my heart. I'm perplexed, but I'm not in despair because the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is shining in my heart. And power is being emitted. I'm, I'm persecuted, but I'm not forsaken. I'm cast down, but I am not destroyed because the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is shining in my heart. Amen? Amen. And I, folks, I want this to be more than, than uh, an encouraging word. I want this to be a revelatory word whereby you're not just mouthing it and saying, okay, I'm not going to be just in despair because, you know, the light, light of the knowledge of the glory of God, but you've actually received the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. It, like you were saying, Philip, how did that make you feel? You've received the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And you're not just doing this by faith, per se, but you actually have received that light that truly protects you from perplexity, protects you from, from the, the, the uh, intent of the darkness, okay? All right, now look at the next verse, verse 10. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. He's establishing the context of when we get to 2 Corinthians 5. Now, how many of y'all have heard me, heard me teach on carrying the death of Jesus in your mortal body? Carrying the death of Jesus. What does that mean? On the surface, you know, I told you last week, I told you last week that when I used to read this scripture, it was bad news to me. I 
I didn't like reading it. I come across the scripture and I go, always, always bearing in my body, carrying in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus. And then verse 11, for we who live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may be manifested under mortal flesh. And I would like, what does this mean? And, you know, there's a lot of translations that will yield itself to the, sim the simplicity of this interpretation that, you know, because Jesus suffered and because he experienced a lot of these things, you're going to experience the same death that, that he experienced. Now, you know, if all this scripture was, was, was a heads up, hey guys, heads up, when you believe in Jesus, you're going to experience some trauma. If that's all it was, this would be, this wouldn't be a whole lot to this. But what's being said here is, is uh, magnificent. To carry the death of the Lord Jesus. When I'm faced with darkness that's hard pressed on every side, perplexity, um, uh, casting down and persecution, it affects my soul. It affects my outer man, right? And I feel, I'm exposed to that. Jesus as we know, was made like us in every way, was he not? He was touched with the, every feeling, every weakness that we could possibly have. And he did what? When he faced it, he did, when he took everything on that we could face, made like us in every way, and when he did, he took it on and he did what? He died. He died to every hard pressing, hard pressing, he died to every perplexity. He died to every persecution. He died to everything that could cause you to be cast down. He put it on his body and he wore it and he destroyed. Hebrews says uh, when he went through death and destroyed him who had the power of death, right? It was the death of Jesus. When perplexity hits you and you say, Jesus, you were made like me. You were made like me in this, whatever's causing you that perplexity, Jesus was made like, y'all heard me preach this. He was made like you in that situation. He knows exactly how that's making you feel. He knows exactly how that's wrenching your, your soul. And he's been made like you in every way. And he died in that capacity. And when he did, he destroyed him who had the power of death. So now I carry that death in my mortal flesh. I carry that death. The part of me that's exposed to it, the part of me that feels it, the part of me that it ha has the brunt of it, he died to it. So I'm going to carry that death. And in so doing, my strength, my outer man, my my ability to change that situation is crucified with him. That's carrying the death of Jesus. That's why the power is not of yourself. <clears throat> when we, you know, you have to, let me if I can say this, say this this way. You have to almost be trained in death, meaning this, trained to let your own remedies and your own devices and your own strength be, be joined to the death of Jesus. And when, and when that happens, when that happens and you have that release, like I was telling you a minute ago, that release of death, that's when the life of Jesus is made manifest in your mortal flesh. Let me ask you this. If... Um, uh, it says, always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in your mortal body. What, what is the only thing that can produce resurrection, the resurrection life of Jesus? Does the trouble itself produce resurrection life? If it did, if everybody who had a problem well, David says here that to get the life of Jesus in your mortal flesh, you first have to, um, uh, you know, experience the dying of the Lord Jesus. See, that's done by, that's done by faith. If everyone who had a problem, it was the problem that produced 
produce resurrection life. But what is it? It's faith in his death. It's faith in the fact that he already experienced the death and he crucified uh, my outer man that's experiencing it. And it's my faith in that death that yields itself to that resurrection life. Amen. And so that's why it is so important. That's how his death brings resurrection life. We who live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. What does that mean? Does that mean you're always delivered unto problems? Or does it mean that, that you're always delivered unto death of your own strength? All right, go, go with me to 2 Corinthians, excuse me, yeah, 2 Corinthians is the first chapter, and I don't have this, uh, I don't have this on my thing, and I'm just going to quote it. You tell me what verse it is, uh, where it says, Brethren, I have you not ignorant of the trouble that came to us in Asia. Verse 8. All right, it's verse 8. So 2 Corinthians 8. Okay? It says, Brethren, I have you not ignorant of the trouble that came to us in Asia, that we were pressed beyond measure, above strength, so that we did what? Despair. Now, over in 2 Corinthians 4, he says you're perplexed, but not despairing. Here in 2 Corinthians 1, he says we despair, even of life, which is another way of saying what? When you say you're despaired of life, what's another, that's another way of saying it. I want to die. I quit. I don't want to live anymore. This, I'm done. <clears throat> I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But have you ever felt that way? <laughs> you despaired of life. He says, we despaired of life, but this was so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in what? God who raises the dead and he will yet raise us. Now, I'm going to point out something here. You know, whenever we get in trouble, we want to get out of trouble, right? Whenever something's bad's happening, we want to get, we want to, we want it to change. The situation wants to change. It is so interesting to me that Paul sets the context of change. He doesn't really deal with you. You want this to change, and and then God gets it off of you. He puts it in the context of death and resurrection. Yeah. Does he not? He's saying, we, can't, we had trouble, guys. We had trouble in Asia. We were pressed beyond measure, above strength. We, we wanted to die. We were done. But this happened so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. He was equating deliverance from those temporal problems to death and resurrection. And I'm going to tell you that that's how you're going to get out of every single problem. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to go... At some point next week, we'll, we're going to see this progression from 2 Corinthians 1 to 2 Corinthians 4 to 2 Corinthians 12 when we get to Paul's thorn in the flesh. But uh, if we go to Paul's thorn in the flesh, Paul, as Alex mentioned Sunday, and I've, I've never heard that before about thrice really means, you're a, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. You know, striking the rock kind of thing. You know, Paul said, there was a given to me a messenger of Satan. You know, he was constantly harassing him. How many of y'all have to feel constantly harassed sometimes? I mean, I, I, I do. And sometimes, uh, the other day, I said, Lord, I feel constantly harassed in this particular area. And he spoke to me quickly. And he said, David, do not give this some special credence. Do not elevate it above what's common to man. Because if you do, that's idolatry. And it'll have a position that's beyond what it should have. I'm telling you what's bothering you is common to man. Do not go, what is, what is going on here? This is a special problem. This yeah. is a special demon. This is a special, the me and that's what people have done with the messenger of Satan in, 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 in uh, Corinthians. Well, that was a messenger of Satan, you know, and, and God let him have it, and, and, you know, and he asked God to get rid of it, and God said no. God didn't say no. There's a translation in the Bible that actually says that. That I, it was a sickness, and God asked him to heal. Paul said, heal me, and God said, no. It actually says that. I get on some translations here, don't I? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but here's the thing. Folks, anytime something comes against us, that's our first inclination. Lord, get it off of me. Get it. Get it off of me. Quit it. Quit. Mm -hmm. And what did God say? He didn't say no. He said, my grace 
is sufficient for you. Well, I can go to Ephesians and it says, by grace are you saved. That's where salvation comes from. It's grace. Hold on one second, Philip. And so the point is this. We all say, Lord, get it off of me. Lord, get, Lord, change this situation. Make her do better. Give me some money. Fix this. Pay my bills and blah, blah, blah. And God's saying, David, what I'm wanting from you is death so that I can bring resurrection. And in the death and resurrection will be everything that you need. Brethren, I have, I have you not ignorant of the trouble that came to us in Asia. We were pressed out of measure beyond strength so that we despaired even of life. This happened so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, he will yet deliver us. Deliverance is simultaneous. It's the same thing as being raised from the dead. But we're going to experience, we're going to experience these things through the death of our own outer man, our own strength. And once that happens, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness, right? And when you are weak, you are strong because the power of Christ, there it is, rests upon you. You want deliverance? Go death, resurrection. Stop and say, Lord, Lord, I want this to change. So what, what in your death, what in your death do I need to, by faith, join myself to so that your resurrection life can make itself manifest in this mortal situation? That's good stuff. That's true. So are y'all are y'all getting that? Oh yeah. I mean that's it's not about just asking God to do something and He does it. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Okay, yeah. Sometimes that happens. But the things that are deeply in there, it's it's going to be death and resurrection to get rid of a messenger of Satan. Mm -hmm. You know. All right. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Right. Hebrews two. <clears throat> That's right. So that we may receive the grace of resurrection. Right. By by grace. Twofold grace. By grace, he tasted death for every man. You know, and became became our the pioneer of our salvation. All right. So I just want I want to bring that out. This that 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 he that this all the deliverance that we're looking for in our marriages and our finances. Yeah. In, our, in, in overcoming depression, uh, relationships, you know, it, it comes through death. It comes through faith in the fact that Jesus has already experienced that death and he's crucified the part of us that's, that's battling with it. And he's also crucified the part that's feeling like we have got to do something to change the situation, you know. Uh, I, I, you know, as, 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 as founded as we are in grace, I can't tell you how many times I'll say, when stuff repeats itself, I go, Lord, what, what, what am I doing wrong? Yeah. What, what am I, what am I doing wrong? Yeah. And that's not the right question. Mm -hmm. The right question is, Lord, it doesn't matter what I'm doing right or wrong. You know what's right. I'm going to put you on, and the part of me that's yeah. not doing it right has been crucified. And I join myself to your crucifixion because you've already died to this. And now by faith, I exercise my faith so that the resurrection life of Jesus can take place in my mortal flesh. All right? All right. Um, verse 11. For we who live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. The way Jesus manifests himself is the death of your, the death of your own strength, right? And I know that's become cliche in the church. You know, the death of your own, you know, your, your own strength. It's not about your strength. We can truly possess that place. That the life of Jesus may also be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Death, how does death work in us? By bringing us to the end of ourselves so that the life of Jesus can be made manifest. And in this particular case, Paul says all things uh, you know, were for your sake because he's suffering for the uh, uh, Gentiles and the Corinthian church. All right, now look, look at verse 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, 
I believe and therefore I spoke. I believe and therefore I spoke, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by him. Mm -hmm. Folks, our faith is not in a vacuum. When, when, we, when we are facing a particular issue and a particular problem, okay, I've got to release faith. What is your faith? What is the catalyst of your faith? What is your faith? What your faith is the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Is that not what he says? I believed and therefore we have the same spirit of faith. He's saying you guys are in victory. Death's working in us, life in you. But we have the same spirit of faith. This was quoted from Psalms uh, 116. I don't have time to go there now. But if you read Psalm 16, it's almost a mirror of 2 Corinthians 4. About his soul facing death and, and, the, and the, 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 the torrents of death encompassing him. And this is where he picked, a, picked this up. We have the same spirit of faith. Just as it is written, I believe and therefore do I speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also. Again, equating re death and resurrection to temporal deliverance. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. Can't tell me how many times I've, I've just put my foot down and said, Lord, I have the spirit of faith. The, what spirit of faith? The spirit of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Resurrection faith. I, it's not just I'm rubbing a, a rabbit's foot. I've got the revelation of the death of Jesus. That is what my faith is established upon. If I establish my faith on how many, how much, how many scriptures I hear, okay, you know, and how much and how much I really try, but if I establish my faith on the revelation of His death and His resurrection, my faith is going to have power. Y'all understand the, the dichotomy there. <laughs> All right, knowing that he raised up the Lord Jesus will raise us up also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sake, that the grace having spread through many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. And basically what he's saying is the more people hear this, the more thanksgiving is going to abound to the glory of God, the more prayers that are going up for him, which is what he said in 2 Corinthians 1. All right, verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. We do not give up. Look at this. Even though our outward man is perishing. The word perishing means to decay. Our outward man perishes. Our outward man is decaying. What do you, for something to decay, it first has to be dead. When we say our outer man is perishing, does that mean you have cancer? Does that mean you uh, are walking around you know, with problems all the time? Is that what that's talking about? Or is it talking about what we, what the context of what we've been saying? Your outer man is what? Your outer man is your own strength, your own remedies. This happens so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, right? Problems, situations, when they come, they deliver, they will deliver you unto death. Just like this morning, I was delivered unto death. I didn't try to fight in my emotions. I didn't try to fight in my, um, in my own strength. My outer man had perished. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though our outer man perish, our inner man, our inward man is renewed day by day. Now watch. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, our momentary light affliction, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. A far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Momentary light affliction. Let's go all the way back up to the top in verse 6. God's commanding light to shine out of darkness, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of the Lord Jesus. You're hard pressed on every side, you're persecuted, you're perplexed, your outer man is perishing but your inner man is being renewed because the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is shining in your heart in the face of being hard-pressed, in the face of the persecution, in the face of these things. And it's producing an unseen, it's producing an unseen eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison, or far, far more exceeding. Far more exceeding to what than what? 
the pro the problems that the problems that were that were besetting you, the problems that were creating this potentially despair and distress. Now you have a light of the knowledge of the glory of God that's showing you an eternal weight of glory, an eternal weight of glory that now far exceeds the affliction. That's why it's now light. Folks, how many of you, affliction comes and it doesn't feel light and it doesn't feel momentary, but you allow yourself to get into the presence of God and the light of the knowledge of the glory of God shines in your cardia, it shines in your feelings, and all of a sudden you have a different perspective. Right? Y'all have experienced this. And you hope, hope begins to emerge. The substance and evidence of that hope begins to emerge because the voice of Christ is now coming in your heart. And now what was creating such a heaviness is now feels light. Because the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is now exceeded, far surpasses. Romans 8 says, says uh, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. It's the same thing he's saying here. It's not saying heaven's going to be more glorious than, than, uh, than the earthly life. He's saying that what he shows us, when you're faced, if you're faced with some kind of financial hardship, and it's gripped your heart and it's tearing at you and your outer man is perishing and you go to Jesus who's felt that, who's destroyed, who's destroyed the, the part of you and put to death the part of you that's, that's being assailed and you begin to see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God and hope springs up and the substance and evidence of that hope spring up and all of a sudden now the, the preeminence of your hope and the preeminence of your faith is now far exceeding what was gaining the preeminence in your heart. That's a beautiful place. And the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is, uh, gives birth to that place. All right. It's working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. If you've got, if somebody just said you've got cancer and then the word of God says by your stripes you're healed and that begins to gain the ascendancy, what is the seen and what is the unseen? What is the temporal and what is the eternal? But if, for we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Folks, now, we can go to 2 Corinthians 5. He set the stage for 2 Corinthians 5. We don't, look at what is, we don't look at what is seen, we look at what is unseen. And it's an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. It so far exceeds the, the uh, hard pressing and the persecution and the perplexity that was assailing us. I look not at what is seen, but what is unseen. Then he says this. He doesn't say, okay, chapter 5, new thought. For we know that if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In this we groan, deeply desiring to be clothed with that, with that unseen realm, that hope realm. We, we have such a hope in these situations, and we're looking on that unseen realm. We know that if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a house not made with hands internal in heaven. But we're groaning and sighing in this body under the weight of being hard-pressed, being perplexed. Not for we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that this mortal would be swallowed up of life. That's the groan. That's the yearning in your heart in the context of being hard-pressed on every side, being perplexed, being persecuted, <clears throat> being cast down. God wants to give you the unseen from the realm of the eternal, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. He wants to put into your heart so it so far exceed what was hard-pressing and what was perplexing you. So much so, that the yearning that you have at the redemption of your body, he wants you to be 
clothed with that yearning and let this mortal be swallowed up of that life. That's the context. That's the context of 2 Corinthians 5. Now, does that preclude that we're going to have a redemption of our bodies? Well, of course. But, but, but what he's saying, folks, is this. You don't have to put off your mortal body to receive to receive the glory of God and the life of Jesus in your mortal body. That's what he's saying. Jesus, by faith, has already, has already destroyed our outer man. If the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a house not made with hands in the heavens. Paul is saying, guys, in the realm of faith, in the realm of faith, that has taken place. That has taken place. Your outer man has been destroyed. Amen. Your outer man has been crucified. Your outer man is decaying. So enjoy the inner man that can come up and give life to your mortal flesh while still in this body. And the voice of those cries, the voice of those intercessions is what it's what's so beautiful about the gift of praying and praying in other tongues. Because you cannot, Romans 8, and we, next week we'll go to Romans 8. Now that we've established what 2 Corinthians 4 and 2 Corinthians 5, then now you will be able to understand Romans 8 and then how the prayers of praying in the Spirit actually recruit this realm, recruit the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Amen. That was tough to do here on uh, in the fellowship hall with uh, five or six people. But this is a you know I, I encourage you guys just meditate this Second Corinthians four and roll it into Second Corinthians five and and again that this mortal would be swallowed up of life. He, he, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the first fruits of his spirit. It's the first fruit of the spirit, folks, that's doing the yearning because he wants us to have the life of Jesus made manifest in our mortal flesh. Amen. And it's the yearning of that first fruit of the spirit that we can give voice to when we begin to pray in other tongues and pray in the spirit. Mm -hmm. And I, like I told you last week, and I'll close with this, I, when I, no matter how I feel, you know, no matter how I feel, which is, you know, let's face it, you don't just all of a sudden feel all anointed every morning. And I think that's an understatement, right? Yeah, really? Yeah. And so, you know, I'll stop, especially when you try to pray in tongues. Praying in tongues is potentially extremely boring because your mind is unfruitful. You know, and you want your mind to be, to be captured so that it can touch your feelings. Your mind... Your mind has to be engaged for it to, that's why you watch TV, and that's because you want something to engage your feelings. But when you stop and go, Father, I thank you that I'm about to give voice. I'm about to recruit the mind of the Spirit and the will of God. I'm about to give voice to the same yearnings that are at the redemption of my body. I'm about to give voice to those yearnings. That, that I can experience while still in my body. And, and these yearnings are going to be the unseen realm, the unseen things, the things that are beyond my ability to, to, make, to bring them about in and of myself. Amen. 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 That's it. Uh, Father, I thank you. I thank you for this word, Lord. It's, it's where I live, Lord. It's just where I live. I thank you. I thank you for the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that shines in our heart to give the revelation of Jesus in every single place in our lives. And I thank you, Lord God, that we'll no longer put off uh, the redemption of our body, but not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that this mortal would be swallowed up of life. Every mortal place in our lives, Lord, every mortal place in our marriage, every mortal place in our finances, every mortal place, you've got a immortal, 
You've got a unseen glory to clothe us over. And we can experience the life of Jesus made manifest in our mortal flesh. Amen. 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 That's good. Thank you, everybody, online tonight. There's a lot of thank yous, David. Amen. Galatians 6, 14. For God forbid that I should glory, save in the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me, and I to the world. Great word, David. Bye, everybody. All you men, you better be here. I'm putting law on you. Be here Friday night. David might even show up. 6.30, barbecue chicken. Come in and have a great time. I wouldn't show up for nobody but you. Yeah. He'll only come. I'm not showing a law like you do me a couple times. Good night, everybody. God bless you. I could not sleep.